Welcome to The Empire Files. I'm Abby Martin. In light of the recent victory of the right wing in the UK now being used as a warning to the left here in the US to not be too extreme, I wanted to get the real story. So I'm joined from London by Low Key. He's a well-known rapper and longtime political activist. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. I am a great admirer of your work and have been for many years. And it's fantastic to connect, especially in a time where we know that there is major suppression, um, both digitally and otherwise, of people who are questioning the commonsensical um, received wisdom uh, in society. It's fantastic to connect with you both. Uh, the feeling is very mutual on our end. Thank you so much, Loki. We're a great admirer of your work as well. So this is a, a long-awaited collaboration here. And I thought that it would be a really appropriate time to discuss, of course, this moment in history. Uh, the UK election, it was a very significant moment. Um, Jeremy Corbyn was running one of the most progressive campaigns in modern history. But of course, the absurdity of it all, Loki, is that Britain is still a monarchy run by a queen. Um, can you talk to Americans about your so-called democracy under this feudal era system run by a royal family? Well, I think firstly, it's important to note that it's not just um, this country which that monarchy reigns over. There's 16 Commonwealth realms which um, have uh, the presence of the British monarchy and the Queen as their head of state. In terms of their involvement with politics, it's almost as if this is a closely guarded secret. Um, as recently as 2013, judges stepped in to block the uh, declassifying of 27 letters written by Prince Charles called the Spider Memos to uh, ministers over a seven month period, which were attempting to play some role in political decision making. It's well known that the army, the police, the judges pledge allegiance to the queen, obviously, not to the parliament. Uh, the queen has the power to appoint the prime minister following the election. Uh, when uh, Boris Johnson won this previous election, what was said about his call to the Queen was that she practically purred down the phone. This was the description that came out from the Conservative Party press office, as far as I understand. So the monarchy is definitely a factor in politics here. However, what we have seen in the past few years is potentially the limitations of that control insofar as if a progressive movement were to get into the position that Jeremy Corbyn was potentially heading for, what would be that clash and that brushing up against uh, the monarchy be like? What kind of things would it be possible to, uh, to do really within that existing system? So I think that while no doubt the system needs to change, you know, you need an elected head of state, not uh, one that inherits their position. Um, this is the situation in much of the world. You know, let's remember that around 39% of the British population, according to YouGov polls, say that the British Empire uh, should still exist around forty nine percent of the pop around fifty nine sorry percent of the population say the British Empire was a good thing. I think it's only around nineteen percent of the population that say the British Empire was something they are ashamed of. And when we look at the Corbyn movement, this also um, brings us to one of the red lines seemingly that he was touching upon. So when arguing that the British Empire and its legacy should be curriculumized and children should be learning about it in schools when saying there should be an audit 
on the legacy of British colonialism, you know, from the period of the 1600s when Britain founded the East India Company, between then and 1800, you had the GDP of Britain increase by 347%. That couldn't have happened uh, without not only the free resources and free labour, but also the captive markets which Britain was using. In terms of democratic expression, we also know that Jeremy Corbyn was a development upon the trajectory from the Putney debates uh, through to the Chartist movement to the Peterloo massacre in 1819 in Manchester, where people took to the streets demanding the rights of those who do not own property to have the right to vote for parliamentary representation. Of course, they were massacred in the streets, and it wasn't until 1928 that both women and men who do not own property got the right to vote for parliamentary representation. So Jeremy Corbyn is very much a development upon that trajectory of somebody seeking to widen not only the parameters of political debate, but more importantly, the parameters of political participation in decision making in the country. Astonishingly, uh, the majority of Americans, I would say, aren't even aware that this country is an empire. So that that's a really, really interesting statistic and quite disturbing, frankly, Loki. Mm. Uh, you have said that the most recent elections were not free and fair. You've called it a coup from the top, and you've also alleged that intelligence agencies perhaps played a role in the outcome. Can you elaborate more on what you meant by this? Well, it's been well documented by Matt Kennard, by Mark Curtis and others that the military intelligence, the Ministry of Defence, various figures in the army, um, Richard Dearlove, former head of MI6, have been the source of at least 40 stories calling Jeremy Corbyn a security threat. You had an article come out in the Sunday Times where directly an unnamed military source said that there would be a mutiny of British soldiers if Jeremy Corbyn became Prime Minister and implied that they would take actions to enact a coup. This is really just a drop in the ocean of the articles that have come from military sources across this period of time. Not only have we seen an unprecedented level of opposition and front pages that have been quoting military and intelligence figures regarding Corbyn, you have also seen Mike Pompeo, the top diplomat of the United States, former head of the CIA, who, you know, regarding his time at the CIA, said we lied, we cheated, we stole, saying that if, and this is an exact quote, not a paraphrase, if Corbyn can survive the gauntlet, so thus the implication being that there is a gauntlet laid for him already, then we will take steps to stop him uh, becoming prime minister. He said, once it's already happened, it's too, f it's too hard and complicated to step in at that point. And this was a secret recording taken and leaked to the Washington Post of Mike Pompeo talking about Jeremy Corbyn in such a way. Anybody that has studied the history of the world since World War II has seen the United States become the premier imperial power in the world, has known that the projection of US power has taken place in, in similar ways. So what you have is, number one, a political class, which at least since James Callaghan's uh, $3.9 billion loan from the IMF in the 70s, has come around to a conviction, shall we say, or a bipartisan orthodoxy of neoliberal necropolitics. So the imposition of policies which lead to people dying. And that became sharper, of course, after the financial crash of 2008, when you saw the basically the privatization 
of the Treasury in Britain, you saw a situation where, according to study that was done this year, 130,000 deaths were caused by austerity, by this transfer of wealth upwards. Simultaneous to that, you know, you're talking about an austerity that led to tens of billions cut from the NHS, which due to internal privatization is set to be 40% privatized by 2020, um, by some estimates. Uh, Janet Newman called it the alchemy of austerity, whereby you take, is, take what is a problem of the private sector and turn it into a problem of the public sector. It's really a uh, uh, a, a transporting of liability from the private to the public and then the assets from the public to the private. And that contradiction has thrown up a figure like Jeremy Corbyn, who held his constituency longer than I've been alive and sought to find a way to work through these issues and deal with people's material grievances. Were the vote to have just been between 18 and 45 year olds, Labour would have won the vote. If it were to have just been between 18 and 25 year olds, Labour won 57% of the vote. While much has been said about how disappointing this result was for Labour of the 11 elections since 1979, this is still in the top five best results. In terms of the top five best uh, results for Labour in elections, the only two leaders that are there are Jeremy Corbyn and Tony Blair. The election in 2017 was the second highest result that um, Labour had obtained since 1979. So this is quite considerable in some ways. We also need to think about how possible psychological self-determination is in an age where digital self-determination is almost, almost impossible. We have a situation where social graphs are built about us by m all of the apps we use, but all of the main websites are keeping information about us which we do not have access to, but that powerful people and corporations have access to in order to advertise us, to us. So our information is sold to the highest bid bidder in order to convince us that their products need to be bought by us. Well, the very same logic is at work in terms of advertising. For example, the Conservative Party bought the website domain labormanifesto.co.uk and on the day that Labour's manifesto was released, the top result on Google and without anything about it identifying itself as coming from the Conservative Party, when you clicked on the link, it took you to all types of all sorts of Conservative Party propaganda about the Labour Party. You also have, and it's an important to take into account when talking about the activities of the intelligence services, is that they legally are not supposed to get involved in internal political activities. But clearly, they took a role, if only through talking to the press regularly about a particular political candidate. But we have strong suspicions that it goes a lot further. Yeah, it sounds like there was an incredible amount of internal and external interference in the election, Loki. I mean, it, it reminds me of the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., after Trump won, the media has basically siphoned all of the opposition energy against Trump, and this is alongside the political establishment, um, the resistance against Trump into xenophobia against Russia, into mm. this notion that Russia meddled in the, in the election. And when you look at the actual evidence, it's extremely insignificant um, compared to state actors like Israel or private corporations like Cambridge Analytica, kind of akin to what you're talking about, data mining uh, voters and really psychologically engaging in this kind of warfare to basically predict the outcome, right? To, to steer yeah. the outcome in a, in a direction that they wanted to. So it does seem like the same thing happened there. I know that they were, of course, alleging that Russia was involved in these NHS documents that 
were apparently helping Jeremy Corbyn, which is just fascinating because Boris Johnson was the Trump figure. So to have Russia helping you know, Jeremy Corbyn win, but, but Trump winning here mm. is just, the narrative doesn't really match up. But you were mentioning Brexit and how the media in the UK was framing this as a Brexit election. That's what we're, we're hearing here as well. How do you explain Labour's near win back in 2017, as you're mentioning, a, a really close victory there? Um, you know, two years later, nothing had really changed in terms of political messaging and policy other than the sort of ambiguity on Brexit. Um, what is your opinion on this? How much did Brexit really play a role in this outcome? Well, it's important we establish a few things. Firstly, Jeremy Corbyn historically was part of the resistance to the European Union, an, undem an undemocratic organization which the IMF and the European Central Bank essentially control, leaving a lot of societies torn apart by austerity, by structural adjustment programs, and by uh, forces that impoverish a lot of their populations. Corbyn understood this, so it's not a force for good in the world. Much in the way that NAFTA uh, affected the United States and led to a situation where people's jobs were taken and placed in different countries where people were working for lower wages, unregulated, unprotected work, the European Union and its effect on Britain was quite similar. Now, during this period of austerity that we've, we've, we have established, is believed to have killed around 130,000 people, the 1,000 richest people in this country across the last nine years, their combined wealth has increased by 500 billion pounds. In terms of the European Union, it has not been a force for equality in British society. Now, if you look at the possibility of Corbyn putting forth uh, an argument for Brexit from the left, were Jeremy able to put forth uh, a pro-people Brexit? And one of the important things that this sort of censorship uh, through a mission way that the media treated Labour's manifesto, one of the important things that was missed out, and originally it was put forth in John McDonald's book, Economics of the Many, in a chapter by Grace Blakely, she put that the key to the survival of the ex existing political system in this country that we have is the devolution of power from London to the rest of the country. People around the rest of the country perceive London to be its own bubble, quite detached from what's happening in the rest of the country because there was a lot of suffering imposed by the political classes embrace of neoliberalism. The closing of steel factories, the closing of mines led to whole communities overnight being uh, left in poverty. Now, were Labour able to communicate that in an effective way and they were not dragged back into this remain and reform-ish type of position that Alistair Campbell was instrumental in dragging them back to, then this may have gone some way to ameliorating the problems that people had. But let's be clear, no other political figure in British history has been as monsterized and dehumanized as Jeremy Corbyn has, and we look at this idea of Corbyn getting these NHS documents from Russia. Let's look at how that played out. Well, Russiaphobia, actually quite like Islamophobia, is about threat inflation. If you look at the likelihood of dying in a terrorist attack in this country, it's one in 16 million, okay? According to... Um, uh, military specialists on terrorism. You look at the likelihood of you being struck by lightning, you are four times more likely to be struck by lightning, according to Frank Harvey, hmm. than you are to die 
in a terrorist attack. But threat inflation actually is a vital part of the system in keeping people employed. So you have organizations like the Institute for Statecraft and the Integrity Initiative who focus on building up this idea of a threat from Russia militarily um, in order to direct funding to the Ministry of Defense to deal with the non-existent threat. Now, the reason why bringing up the Integrity Initiative is important is this story came from Ben Nemo from the Atlantic Council. He published, following the NHS documents being uh, put out there by Corbyn, he published an article which claimed that this original post on Reddit followed a similar pattern of other leaks that had come from Russia. So he wasn't actually clearly even able, he didn't have the evidence to make the assertion that then the media almost uncritically reproduced this uh, ambiguous implication and then it becomes an assertion in people's heads. Well, obviously we know the Atlantic Council uh, funded by the British government, funded by the US government, partly by Facebook too. Um, and Ben Nemo himself is a former press officer for NATO. So in no way is this an objective party. But unfortunately, as is the case with so many, and there has literally been a smear Corbyn industry. It's, it's almost an attempt to assassinate Corbyn in every way possible apart from physically, that has played out across the last four years. We've seen him blamed for absolutely everything that has gone wrong anywhere in the world at any point. Right. It seems like the media had this kind of unprecedented attack, this smear campaign that I've, I've really never seen before. And we only got a small sampling of it here in the US. I can't imagine mm. what it was like day to day there. Uh, it seems like there was a lot of factors involved in this. Of course, Ireland and Scotland have their own national aspirations. Both are oppressed nations under the British crown. I'm sure that legacy plays a big factor in this. But let's talk about Islamophobia because you mentioned that. And I think it's really important to expand on that, Loki. I mean, you're an Iraqi. You grew up in Britain. You've been told by your own community to go back to your own country. Um, when Trump won here in 2016, I think there was kind of a large sentiment from the corporate media, from the political establishment, that, oh, this was a rejection of establishment politics. This was an embrace of populism, albeit, you know, of course, fake right-wing populism. Uh, but it's pretty obvious that a large amount of support for Trump, a large percentage of his base, also supports him for his anti-Islam, anti-immigrant policies. Um, what is your response to the corporate media saying, you know, Boris Johnson, is a populist, um, he appeals to the working class, and kind of downplaying his rampant Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry here. Well, it's about encouraging vertical solidarity and horizontal blame. And repeatedly throughout history, when elites have um, enacted policies that have actually been against the interests of the vast majority of their populations, they have needed a scapegoat. And so it actually performs several functions. But the Islamophobic trend and the way in which Boris Johnson has ridden on top of it is something that should really be given close study because he has been someone who has been able to frame himself as a sort of bumbling, uh, troublesome, uncle, lovable rogue who makes these comments which appear to be clumsy, but are actually dog whistle wink winks to a considerable constituency. But it's also not a constituency that has come about organically. If we look at the development of somebody like Tommy Robinson, who has joined the Conservative Party following their election, this is somebody whose rise to uh, stardom actually was funded by um, donors capital which is an organization known to funnel money for the Koch brothers. We know that Greg Roman is the director of the Middle East Forum. This is a former employee 
of the Israeli Ministry of Defense and the Israeli Foreign Ministry, and they funded the Free Tommy campaign and organized demonstrations for him when he was in prison. Tommy Robinson is somebody who has said that he would fight for Israel in the situation of a war. He has gone to the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights and posed with a gun on the back of a tank. You look at Katie Hopkins, another person who is now part of the Conservative Party due to Boris Johnson's politics. She is someone who, according to the Guardian newspaper, following her A-levels, signed a 35-year contract with military intelligence. Her economics degree um, at university, at Exeter University, was funded by the British Army. She then trained at Sandhurst, and the only reason that today she's not in the British Army is because she has epilepsy. So there are fingerprints of the deep state, of military intelligence, and of other countries and their billionaire class all over uh, the Islamophobia industry. There's a a fantastic book which I recommend everyone read called What is Islamophobia? And one of those chapters finds that 75% of the organizations who fund these think tanks that create this pseudo-intellectual, non-peer-reviewed studies actually also fund the building of Israeli settlements. So this is an important part of the picture, which unfortunately today in terms of public discourse is a bit of a red line. Absolutely. I mean, I just wanted to read a quick statistic. I'm sure you've also seen that in the last three months, a media search in all UK national press showed the number of articles about Corbyn and anti-Semitism were about 1,500, while Johnson and Islamophobia rendered under 200 results, only 164. Clearly, the media grossly underplayed uh, this threat, this direct threat to the Muslim community to to cartoonishly focus on Corbyn being an anti-Semite. I did plenty of research on this. I mean, uh, it pretty much boiled down to far-reaching guilt by association and his support for Palestine. Very scary, Loki, is the trend here in America um, juxtaposed with the UK, which is Trump signing this executive order that essentially declares um, criticism of Israel anti-Semitism. Now you have Boris Johnson, one of his first policy rollouts is planned to criminalize BDS, pro-Palestine activism. Talk about, you know, basically expand on what you're saying now, um, the Islamophobia industry and how it couples with this draconian crackdown on pro-Palestine activism. Well, I think the important thing to remember about the case of Corbyn and anti-Semitism was that it was only 0.01%. It was less, as far as I understand, of Labour's membership were accused of anything. So while you understand that that is an amount of people accused of something, whoever they were accused by and what the particularities of each case was, I can't say and I don't know, but that does not equal a crisis. And so the inflation of those numbers and the insertion of emotional blackmailing into the situation bullied a lot of people. Um, The way that I would say the disproportionate attention that was paid to something that, again, seemed to affect only a small amount of people in comparison, of course, of course, to Boris Johnson and not only Islamophobic comments, but policies which actually harm people in their daily life. You know, prevent is a state sanctioned form of Islamophobia, which really is taken as a completely commonsensical notion within British media, that it's actually something that has to exist in order to keep people safe. So while it is important to focus on the things that Boris Johnson has said, which are directly playing a role in people's daily life in terms of creating mantras that people repeat um, again and again, 
it's also important to look at the systemic policies that the Tories have implemented, which sanction that uh, that discrimination in a serious way. And I think that the media has just not done its job. And these policies kill people, as you're saying. Let's talk about the Grenfell Tower fire, where 72 people tragically lost their lives, this horrific fire, which you were very, very close to. You wrote an incredibly powerful song about it. Shockingly, Kensington North, where the Grenfell Tower is in the district, uh, voted Tory in the recent election. What happened here? And also, who will be most impacted? What vulnerable communities will be most impacted by the Boris Johnson administration? Okay, so really, uh, the Grenfell fire took place on the 14th of June, 2017. I live next to the tower. My friend, uh, Yasin, he died in there with his whole family. Uh, we had bits of cladding falling down on us. I had the cladding in my hair and the fire spread very, very quickly and around the side of the building. Now, the part of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, which contains Grenfell Tower, is radically different from the south side of Kensington. There is a difference in life expectancy of around 20 years between people that live in the north side of the borough and people that live in the south side of the borough. Now, 80% of the housing in this area is social housing. There are properties in the south of the borough that are worth £125 million. Now, a week before the fire, the um, Labour Party had won by 20 votes in this borough. Uh, myself and two other prominent rappers from the borough had come out in support of Jeremy Corbyn in that election. So definitely that had had, to some extent, an influence on what had happened. The borough is not just North Kensington, but also South Kensington is included. So some of the wealthiest people in the world live on the other side. And as it turned out, the Conservatives got about 16,000 votes and the Labour Party got about 16,000 votes. As I say, in 2017, Labour got 20 more votes than the Conservatives. Now, in terms of how Grenfell happened, you have to take it back to the 80s and Margaret Thatcher's government. You had a situation where there was over 320 pages of building regulations, but in the building act that was passed by Michael Heseltine as part of the Thatcher government, he said this legislation will allow for greater industry self-regulation. So what that means is that industry will be able to police itself more. And they replaced what were over 320 um, pages of building regulations with around 25 pages of building regulations. In terms of what happened that led to a situation where Emmerdent Code, the MP for Labour, was unseated in the last election, you saw several things happening. The Conservative Party mobilised a Blairite uh, former figure from the Labour Party to come out and say that people should support the Conservative Party in Kensington. So it was very much seen as the jewel in the crown of the Tory government. And for that reason, it was not conceivable that the Tory establishment would allow for this borough to be a Labour borough. But the reality is this, we exist now in a situation where even the Times newspaper have estimated that 200,000 people across the country are exposed to these types of materials in their buildings, from people in hospitals, in hotels, in schools, in cinemas, in student accommodation, um, this is a national scandal. It's not just a local scandal. It's actually a national emergency. However, it hasn't been treated as such by the media. The corporations involved, Arconic and Celotex, have been allowed to assume uh, an invisibility and seemingly an invincibility. 
And so it is for this reason that I think we have to continually point out the names of these organizations and make them visible because part of the function of this um, orthodoxy, this uh, dictatorship of prevailing orthodoxy is corporate invisibility. And it was that that Corbyn was produced as a main focal point of dissent to. And I think the way that the deep state understood what happened on the 14th of June 2017 was two major risks. The one immediate risk was that it would be a focal point for social unrest. And so it was securitized the way that Grenfell was dealt with. And then the second issue was the preventing of this being a vehicle upon which Jeremy Corbyn could swing into 10 Downing Street. And unfortunately, much in the same way the bombing of Yemen is something that only 49% of the British public know is even happening, Grenfell and Yemen were both not election issues in any way, shape or form because the media were able to invisibilize them and not deal with them at all. So unfortunately, we were in a situation where the conservatives were able to reassert, at least in name, their dominance in this area. But the reality is this. This community is a hotbed of resistance. It was, historically it has been, and it will continue to be going forward. The centrist liberal Democrats suffered an even greater loss than Jeremy Corbyn, but of course that has not stopped the corporate media from declaring ad nauseum that Corbyn lost because he was too far left. Um, now they're yeah. using Corbyn's loss to basically demoralize the Bernie Sanders movement here in the U.S., um, saying that, of course, yeah. Bernie's going to lose because he's running a platform too far left. Do you have any message to Bernie Sanders supporters and just the, the political struggle and movement as a whole here in the States? My message to Bernie Sanders supporters going into the election in 2020, do not adhere to the talking points that have been imposed upon you disingenuously. You will be in a situation where constantly you have to answer questions about non-issues. The public sphere is controlled by billionaires whose interests are directly against yours. They will fight tooth and nail to make people take the position that the interests of the billionaires are your interests too. That's not true. That's not true. Do not allow yourself to be bogged down fighting fires in the way that they were able to um, derail the movement here. One thing I also want to say about what has happened here is that while for the time being, temporarily, things are very tough and people are quite divided in some ways. The contradictions which produce the resistance which Corbyn represented will continue to sharpen and therefore the resistance to it on both a local and hopefully at some point a national level will reassert itself soon. You know, as you've pointed out, this anti-BDS legislation that Boris Johnson is hoping to pass. He's also hoping to ban strikes on public transport um, because he understands the power of the TFL unions and he hopes to break that. What will happen, you know, as we see in the US, where as far as I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, there's 28 states which force public sector employees to sign uh, contracts promising that they won't um, take part in BDS activity. Yeah, that, that's correct. Just kind of, really quickly, uh, yeah. I was almost, or I, I was given a contract from Georgia slated to speak there um, to sign an anti-BDS contract in order to just give a talk at a university. And of course, I refused. Wow. The entire conference fell apart. Wow. But yes, 28 states now 
have independent contractor clauses that force you to uh, basically uh, pledge allegiance to um, Israel and say that you refuse to boycott it. It's unbelievable. It has been challenged in courts and and. It has been um, overturned on First Amendment rights issues, but that has not stopped the censorship campaign and the silencing campaign. Of course, that I think that's the inevitable goal here. Hmm. It's scary stuff. It's totalitarian stuff. And I think the mission is to make sure that the talking points which are placed above our heads with the main aim of derailing and distracting us from the main issue at hand that needs to be uh, dealt with people need to be cognizant of it and not allow themselves to be constantly led by the billionaire media and lastly um what happens in the uk of course is not separate from what happens in the us the uk has a very symbiotic relationship with the us empire it plays a very destructive role as its junior partner around the world i mean look no further than of course the disastrous Iraq war. You are a longtime political activist. You're an organizer. You've been involved in the struggle beyond administrations, right? I mean, we're talking about deadly neoliberalism, this bipartisan foreign policy that supersedes Democrat, Republican, Tory, Labor. Uh, why is it? Any last words on why is it that there's so much focus on the electoral process, yet nothing seems to really change with the oppressed people living under the boot of empire and its collaborators. Yes, I think that that is a really strong and quite an important lesson really for us to take here. We saw someone like Jeremy Corbyn, who was from our number, not only would he have an increased level of receptivity to movements for social just justice um, in a grassroots way, because this was something that he himself had been part of for decades, so he was an insurgent force within the Labour Party. But in terms of actual Labour members of Parliament, the majority of them are still committed on a very visceral level to this commonsensical notion of neoliberalism and a foreign policy which is unquestioning of the received wisdom put forward to them by Ministry of Defense and military intelligence who themselves are connected in an umbilical way to the US military, especially when we consider that some estimates have it between 105 and 150 US military bases in this country. As we've also seen recently in the case of Harry Dunn, a young man who was run over by the wife of seemingly somebody from the US military, and then she was very swiftly able to return to the United States. Him and his family, Harry Dunn's family, have been campaigning for a long time to try and get some type of accountability for what happened to their son. And we're seeing on the part of the British government callous indifference. Now, back to this issue of us having faith in electoral politics, we do know that while you can say that the violence which is inherent in so many parts of this sort of global assembly line of violence, the, the sort of global assembly line has a lot of violence inherent, inherent in it and that therefore that needs to be dismantled, it needs to be changed, it needs to be reconfigured in a million different ways. You also see the space with which somebody like Jeremy Corbyn could come in and actually be the difference between life and death on, say, the issue of ending austerity or changing British foreign policy. So these are changes that are worth making. And so therefore, many of us who for these last 10 years have been criminalized, have been out there protesting, have been kettled by police, have been beaten by police, um, have, have been under surveillance. And this was one of the comments that one of the uh, ghouls of the deep state made about Jeremy Corbyn was that now surrounding him as advisors are people that throughout the 70s and the 80s, uh, the intelligence services here were spying on and they found it quite ironic. So Corbyn was an insurgency into that system. Um, I think it's essential that people do not see that as the be all and end all 
of their politics that they build on a local level, um, independent movements that act as a pressure uh, uh, pressure valve, shall we say. Our role is not to get into 10 Downing Street necessarily. Our role is to provide the pressure that can force the levers of power to react accordingly. And if you look throughout history of this country and pretty much of the world, real change in society has always come from mass mobilizations led by people who are outside of the political class and it is forcing the political class to react to it. We are told constantly, we are almost socialized into the position of resistance being futile. But what we actually say in contrast to that is that resistance is fertile and we may be planting seeds now but we are planting seeds for trees that we may not sit in the shade of, but we must continue to plant those seeds. Very well said. Uh, Loki, you're a prolific artist. You're an incredible musician. You have a new album coming out. You have a tour um, planned. You have an interview show. Talk about your projects, what's planned for the future and how people can follow your work. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really can honestly say that, Abby, Mike, you are two human beings that I am really, really glad exist in the world. I think the world would be worse off uh, without you both. In terms of the projects that I have ahead, I have a new album soundtrack to The Struggle 3, which will be dropping next year. I also have a nationwide tour Um, This is all independent. This is all done by me and a few of my friends. And, you know, we exist at a time where the power to algorithmatize what is and what isn't visible is beyond all previous conceptions of of it. Um, And what that means is that there are both informal and formal ways, as you yourself, Abby, well know probably better than me, of blacklisting people and definitely as an independent artist who is aiming to foster critical thinking about British foreign policy, critical thinking about the stratification of society, you come up against these invisible walls and that's why it's really important that you support platforms like Empire Files but you also support artists such as myself and others who are really attempting to, in a grassroots way, um, stir and foster real cultures of dissent. Not in an artificial way, not to be a conduit for corporate corporations. The aim here is about asserting agency and fighting for our rights. So please support the show. We've interviewed Noam Chomsky recently. We've got more interviews coming out soon. Also support the uh, music we're making, but most importantly, support Empire Files. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, for your incredible and fantastic insight. Low key, everyone check it out. Uh, I hope to catch you on the tour if your visa gets Thank approved you. finally here Fantastic. in the US. Is well, that I, It's very thing? unlikely. It's very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> You could never talk my fire in a booth. I don't need a label, I'm saying to the truth. If you're relying hard with the mind of a moose, your circle can hurt you as tight as a noose. Bars, artillery, harsher than killer bees. I'm a marksman with beats, carving them into me. Palm in me's, laugh at them in the street. Wanna spar the elite, hard for you to compete. Not a marketing dream, hearts in the Middle East. Starving to eat, marga beyond belief. Where they martyr the meat, marching them into meat. With the arms of the beast, harvest them with the teeth. If you're unhappy when you come at me, never miss. Make you run, scatty dumb, scallywags are getting this. Trump rally with a gun carried in your fist. That's a punk patty and a chump chatty terrorist. Intellect, still the sickest on the internet Didn't know that I'll cue show like a cigarette Outline, you get outlined like a silhouette Been a vet that didn't pair the illness and I'm still a threat Personified, verse out of time, murk him Heard all your rhymes, certain that I burn him Merged in my prime, first to the fine curtains It's German, your ride hurting cause I'm Jürgen Murder the mic, cleansman when I'm turning Merciless fight, clansman when I'm verbing Words that I write, sting them when I'm bursting Worst of my type, champion, night nurse him Oh, 16, did a sold out tour Think you know my life, I don't know about yours I was blackballed then cause I spoke about war They want me closed down but I spoke out more Now the silence 
silence is broken, virus is frozen, come to wash it away like the tide of the ocean, my pride is evolving, size of a Trojan, horse on course to divide your emotion, go round to the pen, the sound of a vet, they rouse me, I'm killing them again, 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 the album is next, it's foul that you slept, my mouth is a weapon now again, 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 how they forget, these cowards are vexed, pound the alphabet, again, 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 you're out of your death, bow to the best, put the crown on my head now again, 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 again. Prophylactic, see your old school, I'm so Jurassic, flow galactic, gymnastic could hold a backflip.